So I, we'll start off, I think numbers have, have, uh, have steadied off. So a very warm welcome um, to everyone on this call this morning and thank you for joining us for the launch of My LGBTI Plus Voice Matters, which is a mixed methods research study exploring the views and experiences of LGBTI plus mental health service users. My name is Paula Fagan. I'm the CEO of LGBT Ireland. And on behalf of LGBT Ireland, I want to say how delighted we are to have partnered with Mental Health Reform to undertake this important research project. When I say that we've partnered, uh, we cannot in LGBT Ireland take too much credit for this study because the real drivers of this research were the, the team in Mental Health Reform. Following the publication of My Voice Matters research study in 2019, which um, involved almost 1,200 people who had access to mental health services and over 780 family members, carers and supporters, the mental health team, team were concerned about the high numbers of LGBTI plus people included in the initial survey, with almost one in five served survey participants identifying as LGBTI plus. And that those initial findings seem to indicate that LGBTI plus people's experiences, they had poor, poor experiences of mental health services than non-LGBTI plus participants. This drove mental health reform on to undertake further research into the LGBTI plus people specific and unique experiences of accessing mental health services. And, for, and also many thanks to the HSC Mental Health Division for funding this research project. Our main role as LGBT Ireland was to support Paddy and the research team as much as we could to disseminate the survey and to access LGBTI plus participants for the focus groups. And a very heartfelt thank you to all those who responded to the survey and who participated in the groups. Much of what people discussed in the research cannot have been easy to share. Um, there is an emotional cost to bringing up these difficult experiences. And so before we start, I want to acknowledge the courage and generosity of all the study participants. We hope that today's event and the follow-up research that's been made possible by this, by this evidence base will make a difference in mental health policy and practice so that many other LGBTI plus people will benefit from your contribution. And we'll be hearing directly from Sharon Nolan about their, sorry, one of the research participants about their lived experience. And we're usually grateful to Sharon for offering to be part of today's launch event. As this is Pride Month, wider society is more thoughtful and alert to LGBTI plus visibility and the needs of our diverse community. Our appeal to everyone that we work with at this time of the year is to make pride part of your everyday. If today is your starting point, take away the findings that most resonate with you and make an action plan for your practice, your service or organization. What can you do to be more aware to be more inclusive and above all, to be affirming of LGBTI people that you work with. Whether they're out to you or not, we are there. For me, one of the most striking contexts for this survey is that approximately one in five people in mental health services are likely to be LGBTI plus. So if we think about that in terms of the nationality for a moment, if one in five service users say we're Hungarian or we're Spanish. I think a service provider would very quickly adapt their policies and practice to be inclusive of this cohort. Leaflets and other resources would be translated and staff would be trained to provide culturally appropriate services. It makes sense to take those measures. And the same is true for members of our community. The, members, the measures can be relatively inexpensive, and considering the significant positive difference they can make to someone's life and to their mental health recovery are so, are so important. One of the participants in this research who had very affirming care put it like this, 
her mental health practitioner was a lifeline. In contrast, her mental health professionals were perceived to be lacking in LGBTI knowledge, competence, and sensitivity. This placed additional strain on LGBTI service users and led some to self censor themselves with their health professional. So, as part of this morning's discussion, we want to focus on what you can do to make LGBTI plus, sorry, to make your services and your practice more LGBTI plus inclusive and affirming. And we also have time towards the end of this morning to, to, for your closing, for comments and for questions. So you will have a chance to interact with the panel and the speakers. So that's it for me for the moment. But before I hand over to Fair Grogan from the Mental Health Ireland team, I just want to make you aware of today, firstly, of the support services, services that are available. Of course, we understand that what we're sharing today, the research, the difficult experiences people have shared can be very triggering for people. So those services are there and both the Samaritans and our own helpline are a daily service. So, so, so please do reach out for support if you feel you need it after this morning. We also want to just make you aware of our hashtag. So if you can use on Twitter, just use our hashtag MPM2022. Uh, to raise awareness of this important research study we launched this morning. So without further ado now, I'd like to hand over to Ber Bernadette Grogan for Mental Health Reform to go through the research findings in detail. Thanks, Ber, over to you. Thanks so much, Paula. Um, Bernadette is my, you know, professional long, long name and I go by Ber. Um, and just say, yeah, it's, it's mental health reform. We do get, uh, we do have Mental Health Ireland are, are members of ours um, and we do work very closely with them. So good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to be here this morning. I'm actually tuning in from Cork. Um, so I'm gonna do the usual thing now and say, can you see my slides? Can someone give me a thumbs up or a nod? Okay. Um, so yes, as I said, uh, uh, my name is Bear Grogan. I'm the Policy and Research Manager here at Mental Health Reform. And the important research being launched here today was undertaken by our former research officer, Dr. Porik Ofeik, or Paddy, as we call him. And we had hoped that Paddy would be available to present his findings this morning, but unfortunately there was a scheduling clash with his new role, uh, which couldn't be changed. Um, so at the outset, I want to extend my sincere thanks to, to Paddy for all of the work he's, he's done on the research and, and obviously in his years in mental health reform and also the really helpful assistance that he provided since in preparing um, the presentation for us this morning. Um, so I'm going to be given an abridged version. I'm going to stick on my timer because we have so much to get through this morning. And I've timed myself doing this a couple of times and I keep coming in over time. So apologies if I'm, if I'm flying through certain parts. All of the information is in the executive summary and in the, the full report anyway. Um, so as Paula had said, you know, some of our conversations this morning could be upsetting or, or triggering. Um, so just at, at the center of everything we do is your mental well-being. So if people need to step away from the presentation um, or the Q&A or anything, you know, please feel free to do that. I shan't take it personally at all. Um, so the nitty gritty of the technical pieces of, of the research, the background, as Paula was, was telling us, um, this originally came about from our My Voice Matters larger research piece. Um, so we know that LGBTI plus people face significant challenges that aren't faced by heterosexual cisgender people, and that can result in additional psychological stress and reduced well-being. Um, and because, so reflecting this, the research has consistently shown that mental health difficulties are more common among LGBTI plus people, um, are connecting for life, are our suicide prevention policy, and also sharing the vision, our national mental health policy, recognize the LGBTI plus community as a priority group um, that are more vulnerable to, to mental health difficulties. Um, one of the recommendations in sharing the vision is that the HSE should maximize the delivery of diverse and culturally competent mental health supports throughout all services. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mental Health Commission have a quality framework. There's an inclusion strategy, there's a youth strategy, um, but there has been relatively little research specifically exploring the views and experiences of mental health service users. Um, 
internationally again you know there are higher levels of, of dissatisfaction um, with mental health services um, and in Ireland the, the nice thing about this morning is that you know there were mixed results with both positive and negative experiences reported and we're hoping that this piece of research and this launch this morning will bring that learning to um, policymakers and and service providers as Paula said you know there are ways to, to make our, our services better um, so I won't go over this again um, because Paula highlighted there so uh, you know if you look on our website on mentalhealthreform.ie you can find the full My Voice Matters reports from uh, from 2019 um, and as Paula said as well um, and we're delighted to have Michael Norton here this morning as well so recognizing the importance of the feedback and the fact that there was such a large cohort of survey respondents from the LGBTI plus community the HSE agreed to fund the project um, and it was the, to survey, look at the survey data but also carry out focus groups specifically with LGBTI plus mental health service users. So the aim of this piece was to explore the views and experiences of LGBTI plus mental health service users to inform the provision and improvement of services. So again, for mental health reform and for our members, it's always really, really important to listen to the voice of the person, the voice with, of lived experience, of living experience, experts by experience, um, or, you know, just, and family members, friends, carers, and, and supporters and the communities. So the survey methodology, um, and this is where Paddy had loads of detail on his slides, um, and, and unfortunately, it would it would take me an hour to go through the, the level of detail. But as I said, all of this is is, is detailed out in, in the full report. So it's a mixed methods approach with survey data and focus groups. Um, people who took part in the survey were 18 years or older, and that was because of the original My Voice Matters piece was only done with 18 years and, and over. Um, so of the 1,188 participants, 215 of those uh, identified as uh, LGBTI+, and then there were 912 that were identified as non-LGBTI plus participants. Um, there were seven survey items relating to the satisfaction with different levels of, of health services uh, were selected. Um, so there was an exploratory analysis and a comparative analysis. Um, and again, for you know, the different audience here this morning, some people will love to get into the, the detail and the nitty gritty of, of the, the methodologies and, and, and the findings. And then others will be looking to the recommendations. So you know, that's why we have a, a broad um, covering of everything for you this morning. Um, so just to note though, before comparing the experiences, the My Voice Matters service user survey was designed for use with all mental health service users. So it can be difficult to compare the survey findings with those studies that had an LGBTI plus specific focus. Um, but it did, using the data, did allow for the experiences of LGBTI plus and non-LGBTI plus participants to be compared. Um, and as I said, some positive and, and other less so positive, but the, the, the good thing, and I, all liked, I always like to have a, a bit of optimism with things, is we can learn from the, the positive feedback and, and the, the services that are doing things well. Um, so for example, six in every 10 LGBTI plus participants felt that they were well supported by their key worker and always or mostly treated with dignity and respect. However, less than one in three felt that they were always treated with dignity and respect by the community mental health services and less than one in four reported an overall good experience of HSE mental health services. So there was an indicative trend or pattern where LGBTI plus participants were less likely to be satisfied with the mental health services generally and with the different levels of services than compared to the non-LGBTI plus participants. Um, and yes, yeah, so the differences were significant or approach significance on four of the seven items per, uh, compared. And as I said, the report literally has the breakdown of the percentages and on all of the different graphs and tables and figures uh, that goes much more into, into all of the detail. Um, so it was a really diverse group of people uh, reflecting the diversity of identity and experience of our wonderful LGBTI plus community. Um, to take part, you had to identify in the focus groups, you had to identify as LGBTI plus, 
um, be 18 years or older and have had recent experience of accessing the mental health services in Ireland. Um, there were 15 participants who took part in three, so there was one, uh, sorry, three two hour long fo focus groups and the 15 participants were spread over those. They took part in one focus group each. The average age was just under 33 years of age. The age range was 22 to 46. Um, the gender identities listed were female, male, cisgender, female, cisgender, male, cisgender, transgender, female, transgender, male, and non-binary. And the sexual identities were lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, asexual, and homosexual. Um, the recordings of the focus group were transcribed and the transcriptions were de-identified and anonymized. So even though there are quotes throughout the, the report, the full report, and we'll look at some this morning today as well, um, they're not identifiable with anyone who took part in, in, in the focus group. Um, so there were five main themes that came out of the focus groups. LGBTI plus competence and sensitivity, access, treatment and care, transition, gender affirmation and the mental health services and service improvements. And actually all of those five related in some way to the LGBTI plus competence and, and sensitivity. And because they're such legends, um, people gave ideas and suggestions on how to improve services. So it wasn't a case that people sat down talking about, you know, the, they obviously spoke about their experiences, but everyone brought the rich richness of their lived experience to the suggestions that inform the, the recommendations that we have in our, in our report. So um, I'm gonna go through the five themes now and, and I'll, on the screen, I'll have a quote uh, from uh, one of the quotes. There are many quotes in the report. So one of the quotes for each of the, the sections um, and I'll just read it out in case we have anyone um, with accessibility issues on, the, um, on this morning. So this quote is, the constant explaining yourself, the constant altering and the way that you talk and try to like get them to understand you. Like it just kind of adds to all of the points about the efforts and mental strain that you don't want to be talking about at a talk, talking on at a time that you're like not mentally at your best. So this piece is around the perceived lack of LGBTI plus knowledge, competence and sensitivity among some of the mental health professionals. And there were consequences, including the need to explaining their gender or sexual identities to mental health professionals. People, some people felt like they had to teach mental health professionals about LGBTI plus issues, terminology. Some felt like they had to self-censor and they found it tiring, time consuming and difficult. Um, and we know that from the, the wider mental health services as well, that, that people can find that uh, difficult to um, when they're constantly re-explaining their, their history and, and um, their experiences. So the knowledge, competence and sensitivity of the mental health professionals appeared to be a significant moderating factor in the quality of experience. So those with positive experiences praised specific mental health professionals for their level of knowledge competence and sensitivity and those with the negative experiences spoke about the lack of knowledge and sensitivity displayed by some professionals. So with access then our two quotes here the hardest barrier has been both cost and geographic location and it took me that long to actually step up and look for help. I think it was the fear of being seen to be weak. Um, so uh, as we know across mental health services there can there's service level barriers which are waiting lists, staff shortages, difficulties in getting a referral, the geographic location um, of services and financial cost and then the individual level barriers that came up in this piece relate to um, stigma, uh, stigma relating to mental health, stigma relating to LGBTI plus identification and then also the individual's mental health status. With treatment and care there, so this was one of our quotes, she, the mental health professional, was very almost conservative at the idea of, of me coming to terms of being trans. She kept suggesting it was other things like trauma, depression, etc. This team, theme relates to the issues raised by um, participants regarding the treatment and the care they received, and there was definitely um, reporting um, and findings of the patholo pathologists, I, I can't say it, pathologization of LGBTI plus identification. Apologies, uh, sorry, Paddy. Um, and then the non-LGBTI plus specific issues were the lack of continuity and care, excessive staff rotation, the use of medication as a primary method of treatment and the lack of long-term talk therapy. 
um, sorry, it's like a tongue twister now this morning, um, regarding transition and gender affirmation and the mental health services. So um, one of the, the pieces here, the, the quote, the fact that the mental health services are part of our transition is the problem. These things are not connected. They're continuing on this outdated model of pathologizing our gender identity. How was I able to say it on that slide and not the other one? Anyway, there you go. That's my, my uh, <laughs> um, approval for, for the day. Um, so just to say at the start of this slide, members of the transgender community are required to access mental health services to receive a referral and or a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to access certain gender affirmation services. This is referred to as a diagnostic model of transitioning care. And it's because of this unique situation that we carried out a transgender specific focus group as part of the project. Transgender participants were also engaged in services due to mental health difficulties, expressed concern that their mental health difficulty could access delay to gender affirmation services. Some participants viewed the diagnostic model of care as, as, as problematic, as difficult to navigate, um, and uh, uh, expressed a desire for, for change of model. And we'll come back to that in, in our recommendations. Regarding service improvements, I think changing eventually to informed consent, that'll fix a lot of issues. Looking abroad to countries, if it works elsewhere, why not get inspiration from them? I think that would definitely help with the waiting lists. So again, as I, I said, ways to improve services were regularly raised and discussed by participants. So things like LGBTI plus focused actions, training and education, having an LGBTI plus advocate, um, making inclusivity of services more visible, LGBTI plus affirmative posters, badges, um, and obviously one that we're always asking for, the increasing of the financial resources available to mental health services. Um, sorry, now I know I'm coming up to time. So the summary and conclusion from the report. So the project serves to highlight potential disparities between the experiences of LGBTI plus and non-LGBTI plus mental health service users. It also highlights the range and diversity of LGBTI plus people's experiences. So some of them are, are experiencing mental health service provision that does reflect national mental health policy, that does reflect the national LGBTI plus strategies, and that does reflect that there is guidance for mental health service staff working with LGBTI plus service users. Others are not having a wholly positive experience and some are having predominantly ne negative experiences. Um, so I'm going to go on to our recommendations now. Our, um, so we've 12 recommendations that are relating to three areas. So the LGBTI plus competence and sensitive service provision, treatment and care, and then research and consultation. So I've copied these over. Um, there's my timer. I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so I won't read these out, but uh, so six under the LGBTI plus competent and sensitive service provision, you know, reviewing, update and, and policies and procedures, the training, educational resources, reviewing and updating good practice. Um, and you'll see there that we've said as well on number five, this should be done regularly and in consultation with LGBTI plus mental health service users. You know, we need to be talking to people accessing the services to find out what their real experience is. And on number six as well there, we've just mentioned the intersectionality of issues facing people with mental health difficulties. You know, we don't fit into a, a nice box of LGBTI plus or, you know, mental health difficulties or a person of color or, you know, a, a member of the traveler community. There's an intersection um, that, that needs to be, the person needs to be seen as, as, as a whole and, and um, cared for and, and treated and supported in that way. So with the treatment on mental health, we have four specific recommendations here for the HSE mental health services. Um, around developing consistent relationships with professionals, the uh, LGBTI plus friendly reading material and literature and resources, and also information and signposting to, to other community services and supports. Um, we do have two, we, we love our research in mental health reform, um, and we've, we've loads of it. Um, uh, so two of our recommendations relate specifically to, to research and uh, evaluation and given the findings in relation to the model of care, 
um, we suggest that a more in-depth review of transition model of care should be conducted and again should include experiences of service users and for the second one we are also asking for regular consultations with LGBTI plus mental health service users to be carried out. Um, so with no, uh, that, that's me, I'll, I'll stop and I'll be back for the Q&A. Thank you so much, so excited to be here this morning and to listen to the, the rest of everyone's contribution. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bert. Thank you so much. And I think you did Paddy proud. Um, so I think... <laughs> I was going to say, just don't ask me to say pathologizing again. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's clear from the research certainly is that there is general issues that all, I suppose, people face when they're trying to access and, and engaging with mental health services. And then there are the compounding factors, I suppose, that are that LGBTI plus people face as well. And I think that's very clear from the research. I think there is, as Bear said, there is very there's positive to come out of the research as well. And you can certainly see, and in my experience, when people get affirming care, it can be a catalyst for real, for, it almost bring towards the recovery, so to speak. So there is a, a, a huge motivation to do that as well, I think, for, you know, so many people that work in mental health services and in health and social care, you really are person sensitive and you want that, the best for people so I think um, that's really important and take away the, the recommendations that resonate with you and um, I think there's obviously systemic issues that are raised in the research and there are recommendations around that but there are also things that everyone can do uh, to make a difference so I think we'd be focusing on those really in the in as part of the panel discussion so I'd like to hand over now or introduce um, Michael Norton, who's the National Engagement and Recovery Lead at HSE Mental Health Engagement and Recovery Office. He's also a part-time lecturer and early career researcher. He has, his, he has his own lived experiences of mental health difficulties and has spent the last few years advocating for mental health engagement, co-production and recovery. He's published many articles in the field of mental health and addiction and is the sole author of his forthcoming text, Co-Production in Mental Health, Implementing Policy into Practice, where he discusses the importance of involving service users, family members and carers and supporters in mental health service provision. So Michael, John, I'd like to invite you now just to give us an update um, from the National Engagement and Recovery Team. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much, Paula, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me um, on this launch of this of this report um, and of this study. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic resource to have uh, for us, um, not just uh, for mental health reform, but for the entire mental health services as well. As Paula mentioned, my name is Michael Norton, um, and I uh, form. Uh, I'm a part of the national of the mental health engagement and recovery team. Um, and we are an office within uh, the mental health services uh, that looks at trying to promote recovery in mental health service provision. Um, and part of that process of promoting recovery in mental health service provision is, is looking at uh, the involvement of service users, family members and carers in that process. And we do that through a number of principles that we have that underpins our work in the office. And that includes the centrality of the service users with experience and the co-production of recovery oriented services, each of which involve people at the center of everything we do. Um, I, I suppose I have um, a per my own personal lived experiences as well of mental health challenges. Um, and obvious and of as uh, my own sexuality journey through the mental health services as well. And I would have accessed mental health services uh, to support me in, I suppose, um, coming out um, um, as a member of the LGBTI plus community um, and also just to deal with my own mental health challenges as well. So I can totally understand the importance of this report um, and its findings uh, for us in both a personal context, but also in an organizational context as well. 
looking at some of the report findings that are there, and, and there's some staggering report, report findings there, um, the fact that the majority of people that were 18 to 25 year, years old in this report did identify as LGBTI+, plus, um, and most of them suffering from uh, depressive illness as well. Uh, you know, when we're looking at the stats as well, and uh, considering whereabouts uh, everybody, um, these individuals were per CHO, which is community healthcare organization, so that's uh, the area of um, where you're actually getting treatment in. Um, you can see that many of these areas, um, many of these people have come from areas uh, that uh, there are large cities um, and 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 uh, an actual uh, LGBT plus scene as well. Um, it's it's really interesting from my point of view as as a national engagement and recovery lead to see that 43% had mentioned that there was a poor experience that they had um, in terms of uh, their experience with mental health services. But ideally, as well, uh, it, was it was encouraging to hear that 58% of, of individuals felt that they actually were supported uh, by their key worker. Really, although there was mixed results, it was really, really encouraging to see that as well. And I suppose part about my work in, in the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery is looking at these kind of findings, seeing how can we actually improve this, um, because we all have a recovery journey to go through. Uh, and sometimes that does involve the use of mental health services. Um, and that's where I come in, because how do we actually uh, support services in being as inclusive as possible? How do we support services in, in, in ensuring that they involve service users, family members and carers in the whole, in the whole aspect of the journey as well? You know, um, and that, and that's where one of the recommendations that Burr has uh, brought us through today, um, which was about inclus including the LGBT plus community um, in in service provision, and we are starting to look at that in the Office of Mental Health Engagement and Recovery. Uh, one of my colleagues in the office, uh, John, is actually looking at uh, looking at minority groups such as the LGBT plus community, the traveling community and so on and trying to get them involved in the mental health services um, and how we can improve that for improve the level of care for those people um, you know looking at some of the further findings as well you know uh, I can relate to some of these in, in terms of needing to self-censor um, about their sexual about their sexuality um, you know and, and, and feeling like that you need to hide sometimes um, who you are as a person when you're going to your services in, in, in order to, because of the fear of the actual fact that you might be stigmatized because you are a member of the LGBTI community. And it's interesting that there's a double stigma happening there. Uh, and it's noted in the report uh, that there's the stigma of, you know, of being a mental health service user, but also that stigma of have, being uh, the LGBT plus community as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of heart wrenching to hear that that's still the case here in the 21st century. Um, and I suppose what our work in the office and, and using these findings in, in the office uh, to support us in actually, you know, making recommendations to service providers that, that, that helps them to be more inclusive of people with lived, experience, with lived experience, but also more inclusive of people from the LGBT plus community as well. Um, you know, it's 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 it, it was interesting to hear as well how access was an issue as well in terms of waiting lists to, to, to gain access to services, and obviously as well concerning to hear that unfortunately, um, in order to get the the, the care uh, that people deserve, uh, sometimes it is about pathologizing uh, the mental health challenges as well, which is concerning to hear, um, but uh, but we need to we need to work together on that as well. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at these uh, and there's, there's several recommendations throughout this, 
um, throughout the report that is really important. Um, and uh, one of them is about LGBT plus education, which is something my colleague Fiona is working working on um, in, in, in her role as National Engagement and Recovery Lead. Um, so one of the aspects of what we do in the office is called recovery education, which is using your lived experiences of a mental health challenge or being a family member or care of a mental health challenge and using that along with knowledge from service providers to create an educational program um, that would actually support people to understand an all round understanding of a, a, mental health, a mental health challenge or an issue. And I suppose really one of the tasks that my, my colleague Fiona has been looking at is universal access to recovery education. How do we get those people that may not normally attend recovery education into recovery education. And it's interesting to see that uh, in the report, one of the recommendations is about, you know, we need to have um, uh, education uh, specifically relating to LGBT plus communities, but relating that to service providers as well. And, and that's something that I think hopefully ourselves in mental health engagement and recovery and uh, mental health reform can work together on and LGBT Ireland as well to, to support that um, development of recovery education as well. Uh, so uh, really, I suppose, uh, I, I know I'm out of time there, Paula, so apologies, um, but it was really an interesting report to read, really, really useful findings for us as a mental health service uh, to work at and to learn from and to develop as we go on uh, forward into the future. And once again, thank you for having me at this event, and uh, I look forward to reading the full report. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael, um, and thanks for the work that you're doing in the National Office. I think it's so important that, as you say, the centrality and co-production to have people who are using services at the centre is absolutely key. Um, and also, I think you so clearly said it there around, I think as well, that that self-censorship and the general issue around wait, waiting times is very difficult for our community because people really have an awful lot of time to think and to, to get anxious and it just has such a detrimental effect on their mental health and um, because of the dual issues that they're, they're worrying about as they wait for services so so i suppose we have we're fully behind all of the work that mental health reform and others are doing around the more general issues and um, that are that are problematic and um, i suppose around mental health services in ireland so I'd like to invite now our panellists, uh, um, Sharon Olin and Lilith Ferreira O'Carroll to, to, to switch on their cameras. Hi Lilith, hi Sharon. Um, so we, we, we will try and, and be, keep to time as best we can. And, and just to say before I start, um, we just noticed there that we don't actually have the chat function switched on. So apologies to the audience, but you can then, if we're, we're gonna to start to take questions around 10.35. So if you want to just raise your hand and we'll get to as many questions as we can um, before Roshin comes on at a quarter to 11. So Shar, I might start with you just to, to, to introduce you to everyone. So Shar Nolan is Bi Plus Ireland coordinator, artist and activist. Shar took part in the focus groups for the My LGBTI Plus Voices Matter report and their views and experiences of mental health services have helped to inform the research. We're very grateful to Shar for their valuable contribution. And I'll actually introduce Lilith as well, and then we'll, we'll kick off with some questions. So Lilith Ferreira Carroll is Tenney's National Community Development Officer. Her work focuses on promoting mental health resilience and capacity building within the trans community in Ireland through community events and liaising with trans peer support groups around the country. Lilith holds a master's in international development as well as a degree in digital media and prior to joining Tenny, she was overseas communications officer for Concern Worldwide and also worked as a videographer. And I love these events because I get to hear more about people that I see every day. So that's that's great to hear those bios. 
So, Shara, I might go to you first. And again, thanks so much for participating in the research. And I suppose that's why it is such a powerful study because of those lived experiences. So I suppose, would you be, do you tell us as much as you're comfortable with, I suppose, your experiences of mental health services in Ireland? And did you encounter any challenges when you're using mental health services? Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to answer. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this launch this morning. Uh, my own personal experiences have been quite a mixed bag, but for many reasons, like there can be gaps in service knowledge, uh, lack of LGBTQ awareness, long delays in accessing services, or being forced to access private services uh, when needing urgent care just because the services literally aren't there. Um, like I've had, I've had positives, I've had negatives, but similar to what was said earlier in the report, a lot of the positive experiences I have are linked back to individual practitioners rather than kind of a wider positivity of the service. Um, but because due to the rotational nature of a lot of our HSE mental health services, you see that person once and you never see them again. Um, I think specifically for as like, as an LGBT person, there's almost like a spectrum of difficulty with going through the Melton Health Services because you'll have people who don't have any LGBT awareness or knowledge and that can sometimes put pressure on you to either not talk about it or be pushed into a facilitator or educator kind of role when you're going into a service for support. There can be service providers who mean the absolute best in the world and be like oh we treat everyone all the same that's all fine where they're not understanding the importance of our lgbt plus identity and kind of recognizing the specific uh struggles that we could have or the specific experiences and then unfortunately a small minority who hold negative opinions to the lgbtq community um also like as a kind of personal anecdote um like I do a lot of volunteer work. I work with BiPlus Ireland. I've worked with LGBT Ireland on different projects. And one, the one service provider recommended once when I was asking about support, they were like, oh, there's this local LGBT peer support group. Um, I think this could be a really great fit for you. And I was very delighted to hear that he was familiar with this, but I was like, uh, I'm a volunteer who helps run that service. <laughs> Uh, which once again just like our organizers or LGBT like people who are already volunteering their time because we recognize the support that people need sometimes can get, get left behind by the services themselves because they they are the people running the service um, and I think that just really highlights that the services are so scarce that if you're someone who volunteers for that sorry there's nowhere really where you can turn um but I know one thing that I have found kind of positive in I suppose the last kind of 12 months is I've started getting into the habit of bringing an advocate with me like usually it's my lovely partner and she kind of comes in as an advocate for me um and I've only had positive experiences with that and I feel like kind of bringing in my partner almost as a very visual cue that like hello I'm LGBT uh here is my fiance who is a woman uh and I think it's just sometimes it could just be that visual reminder uh of this is an LGBT person but also the fact that the service are have no problem with me bringing in an advocate to help me um has just been kind of helpful for me navigating the services Thanks, Sharon. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, that's an important aspect, isn't it? That you can and you can have your advocate and you can have that people see you in the round in a sense and see us in our families and with our supporters and our friends. Um, I suppose the, the, the research really shows the importance of knowledge and LGBTI knowledge and sensitivity for staff that they, if they have that and you said you know and I know you well and you're a very vocal person you know you've <laughs> yes. been in a sense do you know what I mean no but yeah. I mean in the best sense that you're an activist and I'm 
but I'm very struck by you saying like you might see the same person twice yeah but that even for us that are out and act activists you do in your head go I'm not saying this or I have to say this again so yeah. I suppose if you could make wave a magic wand what would LGBTI sensitivity and competence and knowledge mean to you in um, mental health services well, I think um, just that knowledge and community awareness, like recognizing the minority stress that LGBT plus people live under or that or lived experiences or our, our concerns or our worries, that they're not pathologized and they're treated as like, I don't know, like worrying about homophobia isn't treated as as an irrational thing because unfortunately in Ireland in 2022 uh, things like that are on the rise um, I think it's also very important that you're not forced to either self-censor where you're not talking about these things or where you're pushed into an educator position where you're like okay well I'm going to use this very precious time that I have with this service to educate this person about LGBT plus like competence or terminology and in the back of my head I'm like well this is great for the next person who comes into this room with this person but it's not really a help for me right now and it actually it actually took me a number of years to kind of realize that oh I'm putting myself in that position where I'm like oh here's this information here's this here's that um here are all these recommendations and then realizing that I wasn't actually getting any support um and I think it was talking to a friend once and describing like we were talking about like how it can be kind of challenging to bring this up and I started kind of explaining being like oh you know well I go in and I'll like tell them if they have any questions or I'll tell them send, give them resources and stuff and as I was explaining it to my friend I realized wait a minute that's not what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm accessing those services um, so it would be a huge stress and a huge weight off our shoulders if we knew for definite when going into these services that they would be there would be a certain level of LGBTI plus competence and sensitivity. Yeah, brilliant, Shara. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the compounding nature of it as well is that is massive. I think when health and social care professionals can empathise with that that. Do you know that something happens it's actually a compounded because of what we've been through potentially or what we've had to experience even collectively and um, that can be absolutely massive so I suppose it's it's a, just a final question to you before I go to Lilith really it's um, and you've said it there but what changes specifically then would you like to see to improve mental health services yeah um... Well, number one would be greater funding and uh, largely increasing the abundance of services uh, that are through the HSC rather than a lot of charity services and voluntary services that are picking up the slack at the moment. Um, I think there needs to be mandatory LGBTI plus information and sensitivity training for all mental health providers and frankly, all across all field, medical fields. Like I'm aware that there is some supports and training. I think Tenny provided one preview um, over the years about trans healthcare, but so many of these services, they're self-referrals. So the people who are opting to go and do them are the people who don't really need to do them. And the people who need it the most would never go, I'm gonna spend my weekend doing that. And I think that can be one of the largest kind of barriers of when these things aren't something that's just part of your training and you have to self-select to do it you just the people in the room aren't the people who need to hear it the most um i think having lgbtq resources like within services like be it like a poster with support numbers or local lgbt plus groups and i think it can be yes the peer support but also the community groups because like being LGBT isn't just a negative thing like we have a huge and wonderful community where like we support each other and we are there for each other and we build like resilience and joy together um I'd also love to see that if there was a way for 
like staff to I don't know maybe have I, but there was something with the HSC before where LGBTQ staff and allies could have like a pin or a lanyard like I'd love to see that kind of maybe maybe having a bit of a refresher where it is something you see more common again um, or even just knowing that being informed that there is LGBTQ staff um, as part of the practice like I know one of my most positive experiences I had was with someone who was a community member and they were like I'm a community member and I'm not the only community member who works here Mm. Um, Mm. because that was just it was lovely it was like okay I don't have to explain Mm. myself or position it Um, obviously wider support for LGBTQ people in wider society would always be great but I don't think the HSE alone can do that Mm. Uh, Mm greater trans and non-binary like awareness and information and then just being aware of gender inclusive language across services uh, that you're not I suppose potentially leaving people behind or having people Mm. fall through the cracks because Mm. they're of a more marginalized gender um, because that can be quite an issue as well Mm. Um, but I don't know I think that's all my ideas for now <laughs> listen that'll do do you know what I mean yeah. we'll get, we'll get, <laughs> if we get all those done now by yeah to next year and I think such an important point and it comes up time and time again is the fact that people it's we're speaking to the conversion a lot of the time that people opt into training and also that and it was good to hear Michael say it, they're working on it too that they're you know we need to scale up training and it needs to be to everyone. And I think that's what's so strong with this research. It's every fifth person in the door, you have to have in your mind that they could be LGBTI. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it, you have to do it. And certainly from our training, we do a lot of training with older people services. It really benefits staff. So a lot of colleagues of your will come out with, who hadn't come out before are much more comfortable. So there's huge benefit, knock on benefits as well to the training. Um, so I would really encourage services to reach out to ourselves or, or Tenny or others just to try and get that training done. Um, Lilith, I'll come to you now and just, I suppose, uh, there is a, quite a bit in this research around trans people's experiences. And I think the most striking thing for me was that people, you know, and we know this, but sometimes and often that's why trans people are in mental health services because it's the only way to access medical care. So they're not even there necessarily because they need mental health services um, so I suppose just to, to start with you like Tenny's groundbreaking report speaking from the margins around trans, trans mental health and well-being showed people in the trans community have faced significant barriers um, to appropriate mental health care needs so how can we ensure that mental health services in Ireland are inclusive and responsive to the needs of trans the trans community big question it is a <laughs> It's a very big question. Um, I think that what what I think there there needs to be really a, a major shift in the way that uh, uh, trans people are uh, treated within mental health services, and um, there has to be acknowledgement that uh, in terms of trans uh, identities, the world has moved on. Um, you know um, the. the it's in the program for government that uh, we uh, need to be implementing uh, international best practice uh, model of, models of care um, based on uh, WPAT, for example. Uh, and also as well, um, trans identities and, and trans people have been uh, depathologized in uh, by the World Health Organization. Trans being a trans person has been moved away from being uh, seen as a disorder and it's now in the realm of sexual health, you know, there with, say, for example, pregnancy. And so we, we really need to uh, acknowledge this in, the, um, in, in terms of mental health care. And we need to stop this uh, idea that trans people must and have to uh, be, um, be diagnosed must and have to be seen by a psychiatrist and a psychologist in order to access healthcare. It needs to be decoupled and trans people need to be able to opt into these services rather than um, being um, being forced in, uh, into them when they may not necessarily want or need them 
Um, and, you know, we like I know from like a bit of research that I've done in Australia, for example, where this has been implemented, um, 80 percent of uh, trans people choose to opt in to uh, mental health services. And as a result, the sat uh, but the outcomes are the same. But the um, the satisfaction level uh, of trans people increases uh, as a result. So, you know, this is the reality that uh, needs to be um, implemented within our health healthcare system, um, and we need to move away, as it has been mentioned by the the uh, psychologizing model of care that we have in in Ireland, and move uh, towards. Um, informed consent and healthcare in our community. Uh, trans people shouldn't be funneled into a tertiary service with multidisciplinary teams that were designed for people with severe mental health conditions mm. in the 1970s. Mm. Um, and they should be, uh, you know, being able to be treated in their communities, either, mm. you know, through a GP or for a dedicated uh, service like, uh, like the um, like sexual health clinics or um, the... Um, uh, uh, menopause uh, clinic is, is is another example, you know, and and then uh, doctors can get come and um, can uh, G local GPs can engage in uh, kind of uh, you know um, uh, shared care agreements with with, with these uh, community um, things, and and I think that um, you can see from like the quotations and from the the feedback that there is this kind of I guess there's this um, quite a, a resentment amongst the trans community that they are being forced into this. And that does make it um, more difficult in terms of actually wanting to address any uh, actual mental health needs that you might mm. actually have. And actually uh, a real worry, and I think it's a, a real worry because it's often borne out that if you um, are neurodiverse, if you uh, mm. are as, uh, dealing with anxiety or depression, mm or uh, those, those things which are often brought about by the way that society treats trans people. Um, and um, that it, those um, mm. issues can actually be uh, used against you mm. in terms of accessing the healthcare that you need. So it needs to be mm. decoupled uh, from, um, from uh, sports and, and, and care, you know? Um, I think as well, like there, definitely needs to be more access to uh, talking therapies and mm. um, they've had a much bigger and better impact bigger mm. impact on, on my mental health but I also think that as well that there needs to be uh, that that those services they need to be trauma informed mm. there needs to be acknowledgement of societal factors in uh, that healthcare that's given and I would worry that there might be um, an over-reliance on things like CBT or mindfulness, uh, for example, mm. mindfulness can actually be quite difficult and mm. can be quite triggering for many trans people because of the focus on the body, uh, which is mm. often a big issue um, with trans people themselves if they're uh, suffering with uh, incongruence and dysphoria. Um, and um, yeah, uh, you know, trauma is a, a big uh, factor uh, in terms of the lived experiences of many trans people, and uh, there needs to be an acknowledgement of that and an understanding uh, of, um, you know, um, helping trans people uh, from that perspective. And that's, you know, that's such an important point to, for people to go away with today, like trans identity has been deep depathologize I can't say that now very as well so in the DSM so that's a huge point to make and in a, in, a, in Ireland where we're struggling with waiting lists for mental health services it is so important that trans people are not forced into that and also I know from we run the trans family line in partnership with Tenny and we've won every week there's parents ringing and they're it's so unhealthy the attitude towards mental health services because the, the the young person or adult might be waiting two three years they're never going to be honest it's completely unhealthy by the time they get in to see the mental health provider because they're trying to they're trying to say exactly what they want to hear so it's not good for anyone um and i think just you framed it so well that it's what is needed instead and that would be so much more healthy and productive for people um, so I suppose just finally then, and we do want to give a, a few minutes to people to, to, to ask for their comments, but 
So the, 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 the report we're launching today, um, I suppose, is to inform the provision of improvements to mental health services so that they, they better meet the needs of our community. So I suppose, how do you think the findings in this report, and I know you've covered a lot of it there, but in terms of policymakers, so at a, I suppose, a systemic level to improve services for the LGBTI community, including the trans community, is there anything else that, if, beyond what you've already said, which is very systemic, I think, what else would you like to see, if anything? Yeah, I, I think the, policy, the policies are there, you know, um, implementation of uh, WPAT standards of care um, are in uh, the program for government. Uh, the World Health Organization, ICD-11, which the government signed up to, was meant to be implemented in January. So, you know, the policies are there. We know what needs to be done. It needs to be implemented. And I think if there is research done, it should be done on the implementation on how we can actually make this happen and what's the best way to make this happen. And there's a lot of talk about kind of increased funding. And of course, everybody would welcome increased funding, but we also need to kind of think about where that increased funding goes. Is it going towards a centralized tertiary service where those added fundings can actually, funding could actually be uh, used to further gatekeep and further uh, be used to kind of prevent people from accessing the actual healthcare that they want? You know, and uh, we've seen that in the UK where funding has increased in, in gender identity clinics, but waiting lists have continued to spiral. And it is important to say that in order to access healthcare in Ireland, um, you know, we, we're talking about adults here, but adolescent healthcare is entirely collapsed. And uh, when it comes to adult healthcare, we're looking at five to seven to 10 year waiting lists just to get a hormone prescription and maybe a referral to a surgeon. Uh, and it, it's all because of um, that people are being forced to uh, be diagnosed and to do these long, uh, invasive, um, psychiatric and psychological assessments, and uh, where people are terrified that if they're, uh, you know, if if they maybe uh, are suspected of having, uh, you know, say autism or ADHD. That that care will be that they'll be thrown, that that care will be delayed or even denied, uh, and as I say, that care needs to be decoupled from um, that psychiatric uh, that psychiatric uh, side of things. Mm. And I also think as well, like you know, we need to make uh, what I think of what's happening is as well is that we have support groups in these the country. We have. Uh, peer support groups in this country but and that should be, those should be spaces where people can build friendships can find community mm. have community care um, and builds that re resilience against kind of minority stress but often it's a space where people are having to deal with the fallout of not accessing mm. the health care that mm. they need the fear and the um, stigma around having to be pathologized and the um, mm and the um, actual sometimes and often traumatic experiences of having to uh, you know go in, into these assessments uh, and the difficulties and, and being told what way you should live your life in order to uh, be the sort of trans person that a committee a multidisciplinary team decides that you should be and mm. um, it's just mm. an incredible stress to be putting very in. stressful yeah and then it just, is there other countries, other jurisdictions that are doing it well? So I think you've really said, articulated what has to happen, what would be really healthy and, and helpful to happen. So are there other jurisdictions, you mentioned Australia, that are doing this well and it's, you can see that benefit Yeah, there, there's Australia, there's New, New Zealand, um, Argentina. Um, like an interesting thing about uh, Argentina that maybe isn't mentioned enough, we often talk about the fact that they were the first country to uh, introduce um, a legal uh, gender recognition um, by self declaration. But uh, as part of um, those uh, of those uh, laws, uh, trans identities were also depathologized. So in Argentina, you have a right to access healthcare without requiring a psychiatrist or a psychologist to um, <clears throat> to give you permission to access the healthcare that you need, um, and oh. I think you know that 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 is possibly something worth looking at as well in terms of you know, do we 
you know, is the, uh, are uh, these things going to be implemented in the he uh, health systems that we have here, or do we need actual legislation in order okay. to uh, prevent trans people from being uh, pathologized when they uh, when they don't need to be? Yeah, we yeah. And at the moment, I would think certainly any conversations I've had with legislators and policymakers that isn't where they're at. So that's a really in, important point and, and something we have to work to shift. Yeah, and I think you know it may not be needed, but the, if if that's that's if that's the case, then that's that will be in this in a, a scenario where trans people are not pathologized just yeah. for being trans, and that yeah. they can access healthcare. And if they have co-occurring uh, issues, if they have co-occurring. Uh, um, uh, problems that they are being dealt with in conjunction with, yeah. alongside with their healthcare needs, and that there isn't this threat um, the trans people fear and has been brought out in some cases, where if, um, you know, if they're not getting the help that they need in terms of anxiety or, um, say, being autistic or being, uh, or, um, or whatever that might be, or they're not being supported by their families, that, 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 their, um, that their healthcare is safe. That at least their healthcare is safe yeah. in terms of uh, say yeah. HRT or, or or access to surgeries, yeah. and it should really only be people in very um, you know uh, in very um, particular cases where that needs to be looked at. Um, yeah. But if trans people know that that's safe, but I I also think a, a, a thing that's really important as well is that um, as a lot of these support groups that exist, they're peer support groups, they're people from within the community, and 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 Cher kind of alluded to it there as well about you know that the pressures that uh, you know um, that people within the community are having trying to hold the community together, and I think a great thing that the HSC should perhaps look at offering again is. Um, you know, support for facilitators of support groups and uh, facilitation skills training for people within the community um, would, would be really, really beneficial and would be a huge help um, for uh, community groups uh, to be able to, um, you know, um, you know, help build community care, uh, mm, which I think mm. is so important, not just self-care, which is obviously important, but has been kind of commodified and commercialized and to an extent, but community care, because yeah. that's what really helps when it comes to minority stress. Thanks, Silas. And Michael, we might come back to you on that conversation. That'd be a good conversation to have as a result of today, because the peer to peer support is, can be so transformative, can't it? Um, Michael's going to come back in there, but I I do, I just can't see, I don't know if, if um, Neve, you have can see any raised hands. I can't on my end, but that could be just I've got unused to Zoom. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. That's exciting, isn't it? Can I ask a question while while we're waiting? <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I every time I listen to, to Shar or Lilith or um the, the amazing activists and advocates, Paula, you know, who who speak out all the time around issues, LGBTI plus issues, I learn something new all the time. And even thinking that about mindfulness, Lilith, I had never thought about that as a, a, a piece for, for trans people. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you so much for consistently, you know, speaking out and, and putting yourselves out there and, and being faces for the voices. Um, you mentioned about, you know, the need for, for support for people who are facilitating, you know, working in the, like, is there anything else we can do? I know we'll, we'll nod to, to, to Michael to see what way the HSE could link in there, but as, mental health reform and our member organizations our 76 member organizations like is, is there other things that we could be doing um as allies to to be supporting peer support facilitators um uh, better um it's uh off the like i think just um more opportunities to kind of help those facilitators either upskill themselves or also take better care of themselves and I think it'd be amazing to see some kind of I don't know it could be a cool collaborative program to um 
between mental health reform and doing something with facilitators of LGBT plus groups um, because it's something I know we've kind of had those conversations behind closed doors to be like this is all well and good that we're organizing these things but where do the organizers go uh, if they need support um, so I would love to see some more work in that area for sure. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it would be really useful, I, you know, these groups are volunteer groups and um, and I think it's best that trans people are in the room facilitating those groups themselves. But I think kind of stepping away from the immediate group, it would be great maybe if, if we could have um, either volunteers within the mental health professions or people within the uh, agency or whatever it might be that could perhaps be there on say steering groups uh, or as um, you know providing you know not a sort of a I guess a clinical oversight role or a support role so that if there is people that are presenting in groups with, with particular mental health difficulties that the facilitator doesn't feel kind of there that they have to deal with that right there in the moment or and um, that they're alone in dealing with that that they know that that maybe they have somebody that's on a steering group in their in their uh, support group that has the connections and, and, the, and the knowledge uh, to be able to kind of go right well okay I can either deal with this person if it's a, a, a emergency situation or I can and refer to services or I can give you the advice or I can you can you know you can let off steam with me you can kind of decompress with me um, and you know you uh, and to have that sort of knowledge there know that you have that kind of backing in the background you know and if anybody is uh, here today and wants to wants to do that and maybe feels that they can please get in touch with me as well um, because uh, as I say I oversee the support uh, many of the support groups around the country and it would be really great to have people uh, you know say sitting on steering committees committees uh you know having that sort of overseeing role or not not so much like right in the room but definitely there as uh, a fallback for and um, people that are on the I guess the front line of support groups and as I say like they are meant to be spaces where people just form community and friendship and, and build resilience but they can it can often be a place particularly within, within the trans community where we're dealing with the fallout from the uh, from the pathologized model of care that we have to endure Thanks, Bear. Thanks, Elizabeth and Shar. It's a quarter to now, so I don't see anyone neither. I don't think there's anyone there for questions or comments. Um, yeah, Paula, there are. So oh. um, Maria Murphy has raised her hand, so I will just... Um, Brilliant. Thanks. I'll, I'll unmute her now. Thanks, Maria. Be unmute, yeah. Can you hear me now? We can, Maria, yep. Yeah. Okay, doke grand. How are you doing? Thanks for the invitation to, to, to listen to the session. I'm I'm actually a councillor in Mead County Council, okay, right? But I'm also a member of the board of the Loud Lead Education Training Board, and I sit on the boards of three second level schools. Now, there's been a lot of work done in the last few years, in particular to, I suppose, um, you know, uh, being aware of people's gender identity identity among young people and even within the school community and the teachers certainly in the schools that I'm involved in and I'm wondering um you know if you're seeing this across the board like are we heading in the right direction from the point of view of young people in our education system I would find my own young people would be very acceptance accepting of anybody's gender identity whatever that is you know they're just friends to them and that's great um I think the problems from my own perspective would be more maybe older people, you know, they're just not sure how to deal with situations, you know, um, and if I, if I don't use the right terminology, apologies for that, because I'm on a steep learn, I'm on a learning curve as well. So mm. I'm wondering what your comments on that is, in particular with the education system, because because I'm on the board of the LMETB and we can feed stuff up the board and the, the LMETB schools and needs, we can, if something is working effectively in one school, we can replicate it across the schools and that's all positive. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Bill, do you want to respond? Uh, I, I, 
I, I, I deal with adults within the community. So kind of the education uh, and uh, under, uh, kind of the under 18s area is, it wouldn't be my area of spe specialty. So I, I wouldn't want to kind of just say, you know, pretend that I'm some sort of expert in that uh, area, but uh, uh, definitely maybe getting in touch with my colleague, uh, Hannah, Hannah, who's our family support officer in Tenny, um, who is amazing and, um, and does unbelievable work and um, that might be an avenue in terms of kind of uh you know uh, linking in with that but uh, i suppose maybe there's a point there of uh you know supports um also in terms of not just uh, the lgbt community our, ourselves but also friends and and family and uh and uh, people within our community that also need that support and that help as well and, you know, one that would actually take a bit of the burden away from the community itself, yeah. um, uh, but uh, also as well, so that you know, family, uh, you know, family, friends, and 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 uh, you know, allies and people within the community know that they have something to fall back on as well when there's things. Mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, I also think as well, you know, that it, it's important to say that there are supportive people and there are supportive people within uh, communities of all ages you know um and uh, it's it's not universal and i don't want it to kind of it feel like oh you know it's the old against the young or anything like that because um you know uh, there's so many great supportive and uh, wonderful people out there too and sharon did you want to come in uh yeah just briefly like there's definitely some really great projects going on in individual schools like i know belong to offer like school safety trainings and that you can uh definitely access but um yeah like across all ages all professions there is great allyship and it's fantastic to see and like I love that there's people who want to care so much and they're like I don't want to say the wrong thing but I want to say I support you and for one our community loves hearing stuff like that we're just like it's okay you don't need the right words you don't need the right anything like to know that you care enough that you want to try and do the best you can is a really heartfelt thing but there's a uh, shout out and belong to would probably be two really great services um that would be able to help with kind of specific resources for teachers or for any other school staff uh or even doing like I don't know, workshops with relationship and sex education kind of programs. They do lots of really great resources on that. So there is definitely avenues you can follow. Thanks, Sarah. And Ria, yeah, I think this, we launched the Trans Equality Together Coalition uh, on Monday. Really, the, the part of the aim of that coalition is to have conversations. So exactly what you're doing, um, I think, as Sarah said and Lilith, like the allyship is huge. And I think really the conversation saying why you're doing it do you know what I mean the the difference it can make to a young person's life to have an inclusive classroom and inclusive school so really encourage your anyone doing this work to talk about the why why you feel you're doing it and and the difference it can make rather than because that really helps heart change hearts and minds or bring people along and um, because sometimes I think oh you know we're we don't know what it is, so we won't engage with it, you know, so I think. No, sir, certainly, certainly um, belong to are very active, you know, in the schools and, you know, you would know the second level schools would have um, a list of speakers that they allow in, you know, it's just from a point of view of governance with the, with the parents and that, that they would bring in every year to speak to the students and they're doing a lot of work, very active and that does, that, that is very good. Thanks for that. Thanks, Maria. I'm afraid that's the only question we have time for because we do want to finish on time. So I'm going to, to ask now, um, I've just ask my list. Yeah, so Roisin Clark is the interim CEO of Mental Health Reform to do some closing remarks and, and to close the session. And just on behalf of LGBT Ireland, again, thanks to the panellists, thanks to, to Michael and to Bear, and, and really we've loved being involved in this project. So thanks everyone. And over to you, Roisin. Thanks very much, Paula, and good morning, everybody. I'm struck by the, the powerful and the important discussion that's been taking place at the session this morning, and also there are positives in there too. And it's just, it's wonderful to have so many people join us online. And I just wanted to say that the launch of the report here today is the result of collaboration work and dedication of many stakeholders. 
And Cher, thank you so much for taking part as a panelist because I just found your insight has been amazing and your advocacy is really inspirational. So thank you. I think it's important to reiterate to everyone who's taken part in and supported the research, the importance of what has been achieved with it. And as we've heard, there has previously been relatively little research specifically exploring the views and experiences of LGBTI plus mental health service users. And this research will build on what is there and can have a real and positive impact. It's been a great privilege to work with our colleagues in LGBT plus Ireland and to bring the report to you today. Mental Health Reform's Boy, uh, My Voice Matters series, it's about listening to people and it's about taking into account the views and the lived and living experiences of people. But moreover, it's about using those accounts to inform service improvements and delivery. There has been development of progressive LGBTI plus policies and guidance in recent years. But as you've heard here today, many people continue to have negative, negative experiences of accessing mental health services, and they're compounded by long waiting lists, staffing shortages, and, and the lack of, of other therapeutic supports. And as Vera spoke to, LGBTI plus people are at a higher risk of experiencing mental health difficulties than heterosexual cisgender people. So it's crucial that individuals in the community have access to inclusive and appropriate mental health supports and their rights and needs are respected. The findings of the report demonstrate, and indeed we've heard this here this morning, a clear need for LGBTI plus training and education for mental health service providers. And that's included with increased investment in our mental health services that must also be prioritized and that will improve the quality of treatment to care for people in the community. Ireland's national mental health policy sharing the vision conveys, conveys a view of modern and inclusive recovery orientated mental health services that recognizes and meets the diverse needs of all service users and we mental health reform feel that this research will strongly contribute to achieving that goal. So on behalf of Mental Health Reform and LGBT Plus Ireland, I would like to thank all of the contributors who took part in My Voice Matters and My LGBTI Plus Voice Matters projects. We would also like to thank all those who worked and advised on the project, and these include the staff of Mental Health Reform, Kevin Cullen, the Director of the Work Research Centre, and Professor Agnes Higgins, Professor of Mental Health in the School of Nursing, Trinity College. And thanks, of course, to all the individuals and organisations who helped to promote and recruit for the project, and particularly Lila, thank you. You know, your, your, your participation on the panel today has been so insightful and you made such important points, very well made, particularly around funding and implementation and community care, so thank you. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the support of the HSE for this project and to Michael for joining us as well. And as Michael said, there is a shared commitment to service improvement informed by lived and living experience through co-production and the aim to ensure that the findings from this project not only inform the work of our organisations, but also would help to inform the provision and improvement of services so that they better meet the needs of the LGBTI plus community and the diverse groups within. I have no doubt that there will be many conversations arising from today and we look forward to being part of those. So I would just like to thank everybody for a wonderful session this morning. The My LGBTI Plus Voice Matters full report and executive summary is now available to view on the Mental Health Reform website. And you'd be very welcome to keep up to date with all of our upcoming research and we're very active in um, our events and our campaigns around improving mental health services in Ireland. Thank you. Thanks, Roisin. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, everyone. And please do check out the research. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye bye.